So the first talk uh, will be from Jean. So Jean is a UX strategist with eight years of uh, experience working in automotive. Uh, he also has a master on automobile and also user experience design. He is going to talk about from a mobility tool to a mobile habitat. Thank you, John. Thank you. So, yeah. So I'm. My name is Jean Leuillet. I'm a UX strategist, and today I'm going to present automobile how automobile could move from a mobile tool to a mobile to a mobile habitat. So I define myself as a, a petrol head. I love cars. Uh, it's my passion. I love driving. Uh, for me, cars express uh, freedom. So that's, that's why when I was a kid, I always wanted to to study. Uh, to design cars and I start study automotive engineering. So it's one of my projects back in 2008 when where I have I had um, I was a student. However, when um, when I moved later in uh, industrial design school because I was passionate by uh, by industrial design, I wanted to to design the shape of cars. But actually, um, I realized that uh, today car mean constraints. Uh, so. I had a project about mobile habitat back in 2010, and I was interested how, at this time, uh, Renault uh, approached a little bit the uh, lifestyle and the automobile. Back in 1984, for example, the Renault Espace, they tried to, to build a link. You know, this is not simply a car, you turn the seats, and it's become to be a, a living room. However, this concept um, didn't continue because actually you still need to drive the car. And um, today, actually, in new MPV, you can even not move the front seats to, to build a living room. So we d I didn't really, at this time, really manage to transform cars into a mobile habitat. Something was missing, actually. When you take automobile evolution from the first car, car with, uh, for example, the Morris Minor in UK started to be affordable for families. Then they became more comfortable, for example, the Citroën DS. Then it was lots of features in terms of safety, airbags, ABS. Then the car becomes cleaner with, autom with electric cars. However, the things we will change, it's driverless cars, and actually it's the things which was missing eight years ago. If driverless cars are privately owned, they can become mobile living rooms. So you see a little bit the same concept, a little bit than the Renault Espace in 1984. Still, this seats, this table in the middle, but the car, it's, you get more light. It's like uh, the roof is like an architecture. But the car can add a value for the customer. It can become mobile offices. Imagine you commute every day by car to your job. You spend one hour to go to your job, one hour to come back. So actually, your journey is very long. If you can, your car is something different. If you don't drive, you can work from your car. So actually, you start your journey, your journey later and you finish Earlier. So you change your lifestyle. It's a big improvement in your life. If driverless cars are shared, they replace the taxi. You have a different approach. It's the living room. You have more um, social interaction with the occupants. Maybe you can meet other people. You can do some sightseeing. So you, you start to build like um, something social. So driverless car, by removing the driving task, transform cars into a living space during your journey. However, thinking that driverless cars can only simplify your journey is a simplistic approach. Imagine, today, you use a car cost for a, a family almost 7,000 pounds per year. And you use it 4% of its time. In US, you get 255 million of cars, and you need three times more car space. 
parking space. And this parking space, if you take the surface of this parking space, they represent the northeast of England. And in the same time, you get people, they live in flats, and the, super, the surface of the flats is getting smaller. The same analogy, you take, for example, a car. A car can be 4.6 meters long, 1.8 meter width, so it's about 8 square meters. And the studio is 18 square meters. And the flat surface per person in Paris is about 31 square meters. So actually, we, we are building space for cars which are empty and stay stationary in car parks, whereas people live in extremely small spaces. So driverless cars can transform the car problem into opportunities. The factors of disruption are increase the usage of the car. So if the car is moving, the car sh should move more than 4% of its time. If the car is stationary, the car shouldn't stay in a car park doing nothing. The car, we should create new usages for this car. Then we create value for, for the cities. So if you take the, the car as a shared habitat, as a, a shared way to, of mobility, this car can be used as today. You, it's a ride sharing during peak hours. However, maybe this car you need to, to charge it. It's, it's electric and when it's off peak hours, you don't need that much uh, ride sharing. So you will need actually maybe this car will become a fab lab or an office. So an office which will be close to your flat where you can meet other people, connect and build a social link with, uh, the, in the city. During the night, your car potentially do nothing. So the car could be like a mobile hotel. Why don't you travel by night to a place instead of using your day? You know, you, you work during the day and you still need to drive to go to the weekend. Why not using it at a mobile hotel? So it's a way to use this car almost 100% per, of its time instead of 4%. And instead, thanks to that, you create value. In the same way, another usage, you do ride sharing, but this time the car is a pop-up store, and by night it will do logistics. So this car is always moving, and even stationary as a usage. If driverless cars are privately owned, it's a different approach. Like they have to become an extension of the living room. So for example, they can be a comfy, um, private space in your house, in your flat, where you can listen music, when you can drink. So it's a little bit an alcove in your, in your, uh, in your flat. Uh, so they have to be an extension. Today we get a, a flat and um, a house with a garage. And this garage actually you park a car and you do nothing. If instead of the garage, Right, you get the car and it becomes an extension of the li living room, like this Hyundai Mobility Vision concept. Then if you have a small flat, you have more space. You can use this space for bathroom, for kitchen, and you increase the surface of your living room. In this way, if you take uh, the, um, the previous slide, we saw that a car, a car is about eight square meters. But if you get, live in a studio, if you add the surface of your car, you get a much bigger flat. So actually, you, the car is not uh, a constraint, it's not a treat for the city, it's become an opportunity to change life of people. So mobile habitat, to me, is a way to change the social relationship with automobile. Today, automobile is becoming a constraint Government deal with automobile like if it was a treat because of pollution, because of taxes. So by becoming driverless cars, they create opportunities and freedom because they link, they create uh, value and they build the relationship with the city. 
So to finish, I will show you a little bit how Toyota approach in this concept, this kind of mobile habitat. Toyota announced on Monday that it will be introducing a concept automated vehicle with customizable interiors and technologies. It's working with a variety of companies, including Amazon, Pizza Hut, and Uber, to provide mobile business solutions capable of meeting a variety of needs. The vehicle is called the e-Pallet, and according to a Toyota release, is a fully automated next-generation battery electric vehicle designed to be scalable and customizable. That will in part be made possible through an open vehicle control interface and a set of software tools that allow partner companies to install their own automated driving system and vehicle management technology. Further, the interiors are built as empty cubes, which allows them to be easily optimized for transporting cargo or people. The e-Pallet was unveiled at the CES Technology Show in Las Vegas Monday, and testing is expected to begin in the early 2020s. For John, you want to ask anything? Yes. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. You can use the microphone because you're. Thank you very much. In a hypothetical situation, if mm -hmm. there is an accident, yeah, who's in in that situation there? Who is? Whose fault is it? The AI? The car or the car manufacturer? The car manufacturer. Because, yeah. because it uh, actually is implement the AI system, so it should be able to test it and say that it's uh, reliable. So it's responsible to the end product. So in this case, the car manufacturer is responsible. Thank you, John. Um, so when you look at the habitat as a concept, uh, mm. there has been larger vehicles already yeah. out on the streets, yeah. which are not driverless. You have your home that you carry with you. Yeah. Uh, the some of the concepts as you showed now about being able to have an extension of a house mm. when you park in the car. Mm. How um, uh, I'm kind of finding it a little bit. You know, just maybe me is me. Mm. Uh, extending your home to have an extra space in a car which is this size versus as big as what yeah. you showed, right? Mm. How do you actually see the adoption or the maturity of... I mean, does it really need to be a driverless car? You can do it now without driverless? If you are actually used... I'm mean, kind of mm. finding, you know, where are you seeing the adoption or the maturity of the curve going in? How far is it, according to you? Uh, for, so, so, driverless cars, I think... Uh, in this presentation, we are talking to the best level of driverless cars, the level five. So level four is a driverless car, which is used only, for example, on specific area like motorway or city center. So it's about 20, 20, 20, 22. So in the case of Toyota, I suppose they will use driverless car in specific area where only maybe driverless cars uh, will be allowed. Uh, the Renault uh, Symbios is working on uh, motorway with other cars. They, they assume uh, 2022. So I think this kind of uh, system, if you get a mix of manual car and other car, maybe it's more like after 2025. But we need to, to think that um, the, the progress will be exponential when we get a self algorithm, uh, self-learning algorithm. Uh, actually, the pro progress of driverless car will be faster and faster. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Thank Do you me. think the insurance and the problems that it could cause, potentially, and those sorts of things might be a big prohibitor? Uh, actually, insurance are interested uh, by um, driverless cars because uh, they think that uh, driverless cars will be more reliable than a human. So it's a long-term uh, thinking. O obviously, if we think today, a human is more reliable than the machine, but they think that uh, in the future, machine will be more reliable than the human. So 
actually governments and insurance are pushing for driverless cars? Any more questions? Thank you. Oh, thank you so much for this very informative and um, inspiring mm -hmm. presentation. Do you think there might be gender differences in terms of the product? Uh, Considering driving behaviors. Yes. I mean, in that way, only driving preferences. Maybe. Um, I think this, this kind of concept is kind of, will replace the mainstream uh, um, approach of the car. It's uh, something that I see for OEMs like Ford, uh, like Renault. However, there will be always niche, niche market, where maybe you um, will see some people who still want to drive the car, like you have today some people who, who like to ride horses, actually. So you will see uh, still uh, some niche market where you get people uh, which are passionate by car. In this niche market, you could suppose that it's more male in terms of gender profile, but this kind of concept is more universal, I would say. This kind of driverless cars is universal because you remove uh, driving tasks in boring situations, like driving in a city center, it's very boring. Uh, motorway, it's, it's boring as well, so it's not, it will, um, there won't be any gender difference for this concept. I understand. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, so um, do you think that these driverless cars can reduce traffic on the road? Yes, I, I think so. They can re reduce traffic and roads because if you get, for example, 100% of driverless cars, you maybe you don't need traffic lights because uh, the, they recognize each other and they will regulate the flow of uh, traffic. So it will reduce traffic uh, traffic jam for sure. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Let's go to the